the branching of the trigeminal nerve is shown here. We're going to have the trigeminal nerve itself leaving the pons, traveling into the dura. Very shortly thereafter, we have the collection of pseudo-unipolar cell bodies that are sensory cell bodies related to the trigeminal nerve in the trigeminal ganglion. We're going to have those axons then traveling through the three different branches. V3, the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve, goes through the foramen ovale. V2, the maxillary branch of the trigeminal, goes through the foramen rotundum. And V1, the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal, goes through the superior orbital fissure to actually enter the orbit itself, where it's going to branch into three long nerves pretty quickly. Most lateral, we have the lacrimal nerve, which is going to be taking sensory axons all the way out to the lateral eyelid and a small patch of the lateral forehead. We have the large frontal nerve going right along the middle superior portion of the orbit. It splits into the supraorbital and supratrochlear nerves that are going to convey sensation from a pretty broad stretch of the forehead. And then we've got our last big branch of the ophthalmic nerve, which is the nasociliary nerve. Now the big branches we can see here are the posterior and anterior ethmoidal nerves, which will supply sensation to the upper portion of the nasal cavity as well as the ethmoid air cells. And this nerve terminates as the infratrochlear nerve, which is going to convey sensation from a small patch of skin on the medial inferior aspect of the orbit, so the lower eyelid, small patch near the nose. Now that doesn't tell us a whole lot about what's going on with the eye itself, the globe of the eye, so we're going to look at some of the branches of the nasociliary nerve in more detail. So here we've isolated the ophthalmic branch of v, uh, the trigeminal, V1. We've got the lacrimal and frontal nerves, but we've cut them, so we've got plenty of space. And we can see the nasociliary nerve here with its branches that have already been discussed, the anterior and posterior ethmoidal nerves and the infratrochlear nerve. Coming off the nasociliary, we have several long ciliary nerves, which are going to travel to the globe of the eye and are actually sensory to the eye itself. So when the eye, the sclera, the cornea gets touched, these are going to convey those sensations from the eye itself. We also have nasociliary branches going to the eye. We have what's called the nasociliary branches to the ciliary ganglion. And this bump along the way is the ciliary ganglion. And from it, we have several short ciliary nerves. Now, what's actually going on here is we just have more nasociliary branches going to the eye, passing through the ciliary ganglion, doing exactly what the long ciliaries are doing, but we've stuck this ciliary ganglion in the way. So what's its deal? What is it doing? Well, the ciliary ganglion uh, contains postganglionic parasympathetic nerve cells. So as cranial nerve 3, the oculomotor nerve, comes into the orbit, it's going to continue to the muscles that it innervates, but it's also going to convey preganglionic parasympathetic axons to the ciliary ganglion. And they're going to peel off, go through the parasympathetic route to the ciliary ganglion, into it, synapse with postganglionic parasympathetic cell bodies that are part of the ganglion, and those will extend their postganglionic parasympathetic axons out through the short ciliary nerves to get to the eye, and specifically to the circular fibers of the iris, which will cause pupillary constriction, as well as the ciliary body, which will contract to round up the lens and cause accommodation. Now that's plenty, but we've got one more trick going on with the ciliary ganglion. We also have sympathetic cell, or sympathetic neurons rather, projecting to it. We have a sympathetic root of the ciliary ganglion, which is conveying postganglionic sympathetics from the superior cervical ganglion to the ciliary ganglion. But because they've already synapsed, they just pass through without synapsing and distribute themselves along these various short ciliary nerves as well to get to the radial fibers of the iris so that they can cause pupillary dilation. So that's what's going on with the branches of the ophthalmic nerve relative to the orbit. Here are some pictures of the labeled structures without the animations accompanying them.
To investigate the branching of the ophthalmic artery, we're going to start with its origination off the internal carotid artery. It is the first branch off the internal carotid artery inside the skull, and it's going to travel anteriorly along with cranial nerve 2, the optic nerve. Now once we get into the orbit itself, the ophthalmic artery is going to branch into several distinctive branches. One of the earliest and most important is the central artery of the retina, which dives into the cranial nerve 2, the optic nerve, and will then be seen on the back of the retina during ophthalmic examination. Now inside we have various branches. On the lateral side is the lacrimal artery, which travels towards the lacrimal gland and is going to give off some motor branches, as will many of these arteries inside, since the extraocular muscles of the orbit require blood as well. Traveling more medially, the ophthalmic artery continues and gives off the long supraorbital artery as well as, more medially, the posterior and anterior ethmoidal arteries, which are going to pierce the ethmoid bone and then supply blood to the superior portion of the nasal cavity, both posteriorly and anteriorly. At this point, we're going to travel a little further anteriorly, and on the medial side, we terminate with the supratrochlear artery, as well as some branches that are going towards the medial side of the nose and the medial side of the upper eyelid. Likewise, the lateral side of the eyelid is going to get a branch from this distal end of the lacrimal artery. Now in addition to these branches, we also have some branches going to the eyeball itself. These are going to be the posterior ciliary arteries, and there are several of them, and we're just going to follow one in a little more detail, but all of them are doing the same thing. They're going to have branches that go into the posterior aspect of the eye. These are short ciliary arteries, as well as some that run a little bit more uh, further anterior along the outside of the globe, and they're going to be the long ciliary arteries, providing blood to the actual structures in the sclera and deeper structures of the eye itself. Now, these muscular branches have another little secret about them, and it is that sometimes they're going to have substantial blood supply through the muscle through the tendon and actually making it towards the anterior part of the globe of the eye itself. And when that happens, we're going to call these the anterior ciliary arteries, and they're just supplying blood into that network from the posterior ciliary, short ciliary, and long ciliary arteries that supply the structures of the globe of the eye itself. Here's an unlabeled version for your enjoyment, and if you'd like to label it, go right ahead.